Okay, top of turn five. I finished the command phase for the Germans because they won initiative. So I, I finished off their part of the command phase. I'll be moving into the Americans next. But uh, yes, the Germans decide to go first. Uh, they had initiative, so they will gain the access to the exploit phase. Let's see what they did. Uh, we started down here with the Falschenjäger. And all those red rubies, by the way, are to remind me as I play uh, what units have been activated. Helps when there's a lot of different units on the table. Uh, let me back up a little bit right here. Uh, shooting for the Falschenjäger down here was quite effective. They actually took out a squad and suppressed another one. This one fell back into the woods. Uh, unfortunately, on the bridge, the medium machine gun uh, position was taken out. It did a tactical fire and move and was hit with defensive fire from the infantry squads up here as well as this Sherman up on the ridge there of the road. Yeah, that's pretty much the reason why that medium machine gun was taken out. It was because of that Sherman's defensive fire. So, yes, folks, that medium machine gun is gone. Uh, what else happened? Up here on the hill, we've got our MG team. Did some fire. I don't believe it did much. Uh, they did call in some fire from the mortars as well. I don't think that did much either. I believe they shot over here next to the bridge. That might have helped cause some damage here. I don't remember. Uh, let's see. Basically, the Germans up here kind of consolidating, because they do have Americans moving up down here. So they're kind of consolidating their position. They put down some fire on the Jeep, the recon Jeep, which is now way down here in the road, suppressed. Uh, so that took care of the Jeep anyway, uh, further up here. Uh, one good thing for the Germans, absolutely a good thing, actually, is up here in the center, they did move up their veteran infantry. They're in the woods. They're actually on the outside of the woods. They're kind of hard to see, but they're in there. They moved up their veteran squads. One of them had a Panzerfaust and did take a shot at this Sherman, but it bounced, unfortunately. So, oh well. They only had one in the squad, and that's the only one over there. Uh, one of these other squads probably has one as well yet. But they did move up. They're starting to get into the village. There's a little close-up of the outskirts of the village. Maybe it's a little too zoomed in, but it gives you an idea of what's going on. There's some big fighting going here. Uh, the Germans are making headway. They're getting into the village already. Uh, these, this unit here, this lead unit of Americans is suppressed, and there's one unit behind it in the command, platoon command right here as well. Uh, you can see some of the veteran Germans lining the hedge there. This one here took a shot with the Panzerfaust, missed. Uh, and that was about it. None of the German units were suppressed on the way in, so there is some contact and fighting going on. Uh, that takes care of this. So the Germans are making a thrust up here in the middle. Uh, further up here, good news for the Germans also, is their Panzer IVs did take some shots at the Shermans on the other side here, and I wish I could get a better view. But the big deal with that is that the Americans, 76 Sherman, right there, was taken out. It's gone. So that's the end of that. Uh, and actually, I think it was the platoon commander here that took him out. So the Americans are down a tank. And the only thing left up here is a 75 Sherman, which is not suppressed. Uh, and that's as far as the Germans got down here. These guys moved up and did take some shots at these guys. They did suppress one of the LMG squads that was in this brown building. Uh, the only thing they're faced with at the moment is this one squad right there, that they're going to have to contend with as they make the advance into the village and help their buddies. So that's the German turn. Outside of that, they are moving up, right back up here. They are moving up this road. Not sure exactly what they're going to do, but I would say this was quite productive a turn for the Germans, and we'll see what the Americans do to respond. Okay, folks, stay tuned. Let's see what the Americans do. Now let's take a little closer look at activating units and how it's done. Now, basically, one thing to, to keep in mind is there, there is this idea of combat groups. And what this is, is it's basically six or less uh, sections of troops, whether they're tanks or infantry or jeeps or trans, whatever. Uh, the max is six of these sections that can be in a combat group. Now, it's pretty much based on a platoon-sized organization. They can be combined arms. You could have tanks, 
activating with infantry at once, or all infantry, or it could be just a single section, like a single squad of infantry if you want. That's what defines a command group. Now, if one of those sections is not a platoon commander base, which this is right here in this case, uh, the maximum is five sections that you can include in the combat group. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. Now, there is a special rule for human waves that allow it to be quite large, these sections. And it's usually associated with the Russians who are able to do that. But normally it's maxed at six or five if there's no platoon section, command section in the, command, the combat group. So let's look at an example. Now, in this case, uh, what I want to do during the turn is I want to activate this LMG squad, this infantry squad, this jeep, and this tank section as well. So that's one, two, three, four sections that I can include in this uh, combat group. Now, unfortunately, there's no platoon commander involved here. Because he's not one of the uh, sections involved here. So what that means is I have to pick one of these sections to be a kind of a temporary command section. It's called a lead section in the rules. Uh, it's okay to do that. So you don't always need to have a platoon section, command section, in the activation. Some armies require it for certain functions in the game, so it's kind of important for that. Uh, but normally you, you don't really need it. Now, in this case, I would just pick one of these sections to be the lead command section. It's a temporary thing. And, for instance, I could choose the Jeep. Now, what you do next is once you've decided where your command section is, everybody within four inches, in this case, can be activated uh, or included in the combat group. And in this case, the distance is four inches. And the reason for that is because it's a combined arms uh, com combat group. There's infantry and there is an AFV, the Sherman tank and the maximum distance is four. If these were all tanks, it would be much greater. If they were tanks that had radios, it would be 12 inches. If they were radi radioless AFVs, it would be six inches. So that kind of thing. Uh, but with infantry, guns, and uh, combined arms combat groups, it's maxed at four. So let's just double check our range here to the Jeep. And yeah, four inches, and these of course are in command range. So this is a legal combat group that I can activate together at, with one die roll. Now, the next thing you want to look at is, is this combat group uh, within HQ contact distance? Now, normally that's eight inches away from your company HQ. Now, we have a company HQ located up here. You can see him hunkering down in the building. Now, if he's eight inches or less away from the command section of this group, that's the one you measure to, uh, they are an HQ contact. And if I look at it, yeah, it's just about seven inches. So this combat group can activate without any further um, requirements because it's in HQ contact. Now, let's say for the sake of example, this HQ, this company HQ, is way back here. Now, he's obviously further than eight inches from the command section here of this group. In that situation, this group is considered out of HQ contact. They're not in contact with the company headquarters, too far away. And when this happens, in order to activate this combat group, you're required to pay uh, one impetus to do so. So this is going to cost an impetus point for me to attempt to activate them. And I might fail the roll and waste an impetus point just trying to activate them. Uh, but that's not the case in this situation. That's basically how that works. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind here is if you roll your activation, normally it's a 7 plus. It's across the board, you need a 7 plus to activate any group. Uh, if you roll a 5 or a 6, it's called a hesitant result. In other words, they might still activate. Uh, it's still possible, and it's called a hesitant result. And what you do when you get that result is you are allowed to add impetus points to the die roll to make it a 7, and therefore activate the group. 
If you roll less than five or six, if you roll four, it's called a command confusion and you definitely don't activate the unit. There's just, just no time to do it. You don't do it. Uh, but otherwise, you can add impetus points to make it a seven. And that's with a hesitant result. So it's basically one or two points of impetus that you're going to add. Now, that's important because not all armies are capable of doing that. For instance, let's look at the Americans. This is a scenario in 1944. Now, the Americans during this period, they can add impetus points to get that activation score to seven only if they have a platoon commander or a company HQ that is activating with this group. And in this example, that's not the case. This is just a recon jeep. It's not a platoon HQ, and it's certainly not the company HQ, which is way over here. These guys are activating without a platoon commander, in other words. Um, so, the only other way I could add impetus to a failed role for these guys is if the company HQ himself was within contact with this group, which we measured eight inches away from the jeep it is. So for Americans during this period, they can, in this situation, add impetus to get a good result. And again, if he was not within eight inches, um, I would be required to activate for, with a, I'd have to spend an impetus point to even attempt to activate. We covered that. But also, if I fail the roll on a five or six, I can't, in this case, use impetus to activate them, to add to my score to make seven, in other words. I couldn't do it in this case. Uh, if this was a platoon commander instead, I could add impetus. Even if, the, even if the company commander was way back here and not in contact with them, I could still add impetus. That's unique to the Americans of this period. You know, they're quite versatile on this level. Uh, another example would be Germans of the same time period, 1944. Uh, their situation, they can always add impetus if, with a failed roll of a five or a six, regardless if this was a platoon commander or not. They always have that option. They're very versatile tactically on the field. Of course, to activate, they would still have to pay the extra point of impetus if their headquarters, their company HQ, wasn't within distance of their uh, lead section. So that's the basics of activation. There's a little bit more to it and you get involved with vehicles and some other nationalities, but that's the basics of it. So, All right, folks, finish turn five. Uh, the Americans, during their command phase, uh, one of the first things they did is they laid down smoke on that MMG up on top of the hill. So there you go. That kind of gave them some cover when they advanced right here up to the stream. They Pulled these units out of the wall section are now advancing in this area. And I believe this unit was hit with defensive fire and it's thus suppressed. Uh, I think that came from this direction. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, they are suppressed currently. Uh, so the Americans are pushing across the stream. Uh, down here, they were unable to get anywhere with these troops. Uh, you can see that current situation. They did move up to occupy this position in front of the bridge. They now have the hard cover benefit of that barricade. Something that the opposition over here does not have at this point. Uh, so that bridge is pretty much contested at this point. Americans have to move on to the bridge uh, to claim it. Uh, there can't be any other units on that bridge as well. So there's going to be some close action fighting going on there. Americans are on the brink of taking it. So we'll see. Uh, what else do we got going here? Uh, on this side, we got the Germans in a position of taking that village. We Went into this before, you could see the Germans have now fallen back. Let me get a better position here on this. So we can kind of see what's going on. We can kind of see that the Germans have fallen back. They were originally up in this position, the veteran squads. They were pushed back. One of these units, in fact, was suppressed, but did manage to rally it off. Uh, I think there is a unit with a Panzer Faust in there somewhere. Can't find him. No, I don't see him. I think he's over on this side, actually. All right, so there's the veteran units right there. They've been pushed back. The Americans pulled a couple of their squads that were back here in the center and moved them up to support the Sherman. 
So their center, basically, and the, basically the left flank of this village is protected by the Sherman and a couple squads of infantry. Uh, and that's about it. So there was basically some effective fire from the Americans on this side. In fact, I believe this Sherman tank put down some fire over here and took out an enemy squad. Uh, yeah, I think that was from the Germans turn defensive fire. I'm not sure. But uh, that's the situation, folks. Not too bad for the Americans. Uh, it's still anybody's game. Uh, the village is being contested. And, well, fought over, almost. And the bridge is basically up for grabs at this point. See what happens. We're going to go into turn six, folks. Uh, this smoke, by the way, will now dissipate into the next turn. So that won't be there unless the Americans throw down another little smoke barrage. Down here on this side, I don't want to forget these guys. There is a little bit of combat going on. Uh, the Americans are kind of turning in on this position of Falschemjäger. There's two squads of Falschemjäger in here. One right there, LMG. One over here, an assault rifle. They do have a platoon commander. They are holding their own against the Americans. Basically, they have three squads down here. Americans do. I think there's one right there, one inside the ruins, and one over here, which did take a shot at the German... Company HQ, which is behind this smoke cloud. I don't know if you can see that over there. This unit right here. Put down some long-range fire on the... Uh, behind that smoke is a German Felschemjäger Company command stand. He was, he was a target. He was the only target, so I put some fire down. Ineffective. Uh, the Germans also, because they had the exploit phase, did move this squad with Panzerfaust up into this position. They're going to have soft cover, so they're kind of closing in on that hill position. I think they recognize that uh, the bridge is under threat at this point. Uh, also, during their exploit, they moved up their half-tracks. <clears throat> these are the squads that are in those half-tracks. They moved them up by this wood area, as you can see. So they're coming up behind the Americans, like I said. I think they're going to try and take away some of the pressure on that bridge. Yeah, that's the situation there. And also up here, they have two half-tracks, again, loaded with squads of infantry, um, coming up to support the troops in the center. All right, folks, that's the situation. Let's see what happens. Uh, Going to go into the next turn, turn six. Okay, stay tuned. Okay, folks, got to start of turn six. The Germans won a knit. It was a draw, but the Germans automatically win draws in this time period. So they got the choice. They got one initiative and get the exploit phase. Uh, they decided to go first. They took the first command phase. Uh, starting down here, you zoom in a little bit. Uh, there was some half-tracks on this path, if you remember. Now, those half-tracks are now uh, been sent to the rear, basically, as the infantry units have debussed. Uh, this unit here, this squad up here, had a Panzerfaust and did manage to take a shot at the Sherman. Uh, the Sherman reacted first. Uh, he did, tried to put some defensive fire down at close range and a lesson missed. So, unfortunately, though, the German Panzerfaust also missed. So, nothing happened there. Uh, that's about it. Uh, one thing that did happen down here, half-tracks did move up. And with some effective machine gun fire, took out another squad that was located up here. So this, this little area has been pretty much uh, repulsed from the American advance. Uh, unfortunately, the Americans did put down some effective defensive fire over here in the woods. There was a squad of Falschemjäger up here with assault rifles. They tried to shift. Uh, by the time they got into position here, they were defensive fired and dispersed. And that was that, and I believe that was the 50 cal on the Jeep up here. Put down some heavy machine gun fire on that position. So they got him. Uh, that's about it for down here. Otherwise, the rest of these troops put down ineffective fire. Uh, none of them are occupying the bridge at the moment. Up top on the hill, uh, the fire up here well, was very ineffective. Uh, they tried to shoot these guys across in the stream, did not put down anything effective on them. Uh, including the mortars. I believe they also put down some fire and missed the target completely. Uh, we did have a little action down here. If you remember, there's a couple squads of Falschemjäger with a platoon commander right in this area. Uh, they uh, activated, did a fire maneuver, uh, pinned an American squad that was located here, went on to close assault it, and both squads basically wiped each other out. They both ended up being dispersed. That was that, so they're gone. Uh, we 
to come up in this area up here, the assault on the village. I'm trying to get a better view so you can see stuff here. You can see the veteran Germans there along the hedge. <clears throat> They're still in positions here, putting down some fire. This unit is suppressed. They suppressed that infantry squad. Uh, they did take out a squad of infantry that was located over here. Uh, that's no longer in action. Uh, over here, they attempted the close assault. The enemy infantry that were in this building uh, failed. They were suppressed with some defensive fire. And that's about it. On the other side of the village out here, the Panzer Grenadiers advancing towards the outside of the village uh, put down some fire against the infantry exposed along the built-up area, over in that area. Uh, uneffective. And unfortunately for the Panzer IVs, they failed to get anything done. They did not activate. So that was that little command confusion, as it's called. And that's pretty much it. Nothing else happened. We're about to go into the American part of the turn. Oops. Uh, up next and see what they do. So stay tuned, folks. The Americans are coming up. Oh, and I should say one thing. The Americans are at 11 lost units, which means they have to start making break tests. Uh, basically, their army could start losing units. You know, some units may basically involuntarily withdraw from the table. Another nifty, interesting things. Basically, what that is, is 25% of your break point. Now, I believe the Americans' break point is 19. When they have lost 19 units, not including transports, uh, they lose. The battle's over, no doubt about it. It's basically 50% of their units. Uh, but half of that which is 25%. Uh, in this case, it would be uh, 10 units. Uh, they're going to start making break tests during the morale phase of every turn as soon as they get to that point, uh, basically 25% of their break point value. And they'll do that every turn, and things can happen, like uh, units might decide to leave the battlefield or withdraw and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's in other words, it's the beginning of the end. Uh, so that's what's happened with the Americans. But in addition, the same thing has just happened to the Falschumjäger. Uh, they've just taken four losses as well, and that's their 25% uh, break point, I believe. So they're going to have to start taking those tests as well. So that's it, folks. We're going to go into the next turn. It's the Americans... Uh, command phase. There's something fun in the rules. Uh, earlier, I believe it was in turn five, this unit here was suppressed, uh, basically from fire from these German uh, squads. Uh, and when it attempted to rally, it got a double six. And that usually means something special when you get a double six or a double one sometimes. That's usually a bad one though. Double six is a good result. And in this case, for a rally test, that means this squad becomes battle hardened. Veteran non-commissioned officer steps up to the plate and uh, gets everybody's butt in gear. So they do more than just rally. They become, in this case, battle-hardened. And what that means is they have plus one to close assaults and shooting and other good things. And they count as a platoon command uh, section as well. Uh, so it's quite potent. And that little blue chip I'm using to represent that. So that's that section right there is battle-hardened. We'll see what effect that plays in the upcoming uh, assault on the village. I think now is a good time to take a look at some of the off-board artillery rules and how it works. How you call them in. Uh, in this case, we're at turn six. And the Americans, one of the first things they did is call in some off-board artillery. And they have one fire mission available. And each side has so many missions available. Uh, basically... You either have to have an observer or a headquarters that can actually see the target. And the target can be an enemy unit. It could be the edge of a piece of terrain, like the edge of a forest. Or it could be the center of a terrain piece. Like in this case, what we have here is the Americans have called in a strike on this hill. There seems to be a lot of action during this battle. And there was quite a few units here. If you remember, there was a squad of infantry here, there was the medium machine gun here, there was the headquarters for the Germans, uh, and there was a mortar uh, section back here. Well, they called in the artillery strike, and the first thing you do is you roll for availability. And it's a 2d6 roll, and it's it's based on the, the army and the year of the conflict being represented, and that tells you what you need. Typically, it's a 7, 8, or a 9, uh, depending on if it's of a general uh, fire mission or if it's a direct fire mission.
direct fire missions are like the most immediate uh, artillery assets available to your battle group, like battalion level guns, uh, the gen the general general level of artillery support is more like the higher up divisional guns that might be available. A little harder to access those guns and bring them to bear here, but uh, you know, it's not a, it's a chance. In this case, the Americans called in some direct support, which is the more available guns. Uh, the availability, they made it. Uh, they had to roll a seven plus. They got it. After that, they make an accuracy roll to see how accurate it is. It could end up moving around the table and hitting your own troops. It could be going wild somewhere. It could totally uh, be right on the mark, like it was in this case, or perhaps even a direct hit, so direct that you actually can do extra damage. And that wasn't the case uh, here. As you can see, the hill's covered in explosions at the moment. It was a pretty accurate hit. And once you've decided where, how accurate it was, or rolled to determine how accurate it was, you roll for fire for effect. And if we look at our table here, you can see what that chart looks like. Uh, and basically, it's another uh, 2d6 roll. Uh, you might have modifiers like the number of guns in the battery, and that applies to onboard artillery. This game has both. You can have both represented on table and off table. Off table, it's right here, you have direct fire missions right here, and you'll get a plus one on your 2d6 roll for fire for effect. A general fire mission, more powerful guns, is right here, you get a plus two added. In this case, we're going to add a plus one uh, to the 2d6 roll. The result is, I believe, a nine, and the targets under the template, and in this case, it's a four inch by eight inch template with the long edge lined up with this, the edge uh, that the Americans are coming on from. So it's kind of like Flames of War in that respect. Uh, it basically covered this entire area, even back here where it hit part of the mortar team. Uh, the net effect in this case, if we look at nine on this column here, was right here. Infantry and guns in open or cover this section, they have to make disengage tests. And that would be on the morale section of our chart here, where you everybody under the template will make those tests, in this case, disengage tests. And uh, it was quite devastating, if I remember. There was quite a few dispersals, which means removal from the table. And in fact, the Germans lost their Falschemjäger company headquarters. It's now gone. They also lost that squad that was a little bit forward and in the shrubs, and that's gone. Uh, the other two units, the medium machine gun, is now suppressed, but it's still holding its ground. And the mortar team also with, became suppressed. It actually disengaged and withdrew behind these hedges. Uh, so that's the result, folks. There's nothing else on this hill but a suppressed medium machine gun, as you can see. So very effective fire on the part of the Americans. Uh, and I should add that this takes the Falschemjäger breakpoint almost to its uh, max. Let's see, they got one, two units wiped out, plus four, that's six in all, over there somewhere. Uh, Falschemjäger can afford to lose seven, so when they exceed that, when they exceed seven units broken, the Falschemjäger are gone. They're out of the battle, so they're that close, folks. And, of course, at the end of this turn, they're going to have to start making break tests as well to see if any of their units pull off the table anyway. So it's a pretty bad moment for the Falschemjäger. Okay, folks, let's get back to the battle and see what else the Americans can do. Let's finish turn six completely. Uh, let's see what the Americans did in their command phase. Uh, starting down here. Uh, they did actually engage the enemy Felschenjäger down here. You can see the Americans have kind of now moved over this way. They're heading up towards the hill uh, with their infantry. Uh, down here, of course, this has been cleared out of all defenders more Falschemjäger around, except for this command stand, but we'll get into the details of the Falschemjäger in a minute here. Uh, let's look up more up to the, down to the south here, towards the village and see what's going on. Uh, Americans really didn't do much here, except lay down some fire. They didn't try and uh, engage any of the Germans that are just getting into the village uh, with the close assault. They just basically engaged them at close range. Uh, nothing effective, really. Uh, down here, 
Uh, again, some of the units did manage to pull off a rally and get themselves back in order, but they didn't do much damage to the oncoming Germans overall. Uh, one thing that did happen, you'll remember, right here on this slope, there was, in fact, a Sherman tank. Well, he come off that little slope, worked his way down there between the woods, as you can see, and he got a little smoke cloud there showing he's shooting at somebody, and sure enough, he took out this half-track. Boom, gone out of the game. And the occupants are now sub suppressed and in the woods back here. Uh, they failed to rally by the end of the turn as well. That's why they still have the red marker. So a little bravado on the, the Americans' part right there, coming off the slope. Uh, there's no more Panzerfausts up here, so I think he knows that, and he's getting a little chancy there. But uh, yeah, that's the situation, folks. However, <clears throat> the Falschemjäger have broken. They have reached their break point. They have decided to withdraw from the battlefield or surrender. So this whole sector is lost. And any Falschemjäger you see on the table at the moment are just there for looks because they're going to be taken off. That includes the mortar team, uh, the MMG as well, and anything else that's left. They have been defeated. They gave up. And a lot of that had to do <clears throat> with the, the bombardment the Americans called down here. It's really effective. <coughs> Excuse me. And their fire was actually pretty effective as well. This Jeep right here with the 50 cal machine gun was quite effective. Uh, shooting over the heads of its buddies here. Against the enemy that was sitting there on the end of the bridge. Uh, took them out, I believe, quite effectively. Uh, yeah, overall, the Americans really did good, surprisingly, down here on this side of the board. So the Felschemjäger are out of action. Uh, the Panzer Grenadiers, on the other hand, are still going strong. They've only lost a total of two units. I, uh, yeah, two units. That's all they've lost so far, so they're far from breaking. Uh, but the Americans, on the other hand, uh, they have reached, uh, or actually exceeded, 25% of their break point. Their break point is 19, I believe. So half of that is their 25% uh, break point. Once they reach that, uh, they're forced to make break tests every turn uh, until they either win the battle or they break themselves. In other words, reach their break point. And they have reached that point. They have lost a total of, I believe, 11 units. And their break point is 19. So they've exceeded their 25% level. So they're making break tests. And they're about to do that now, in fact. We take a look at the chart. It's really a simple procedure. Uh, once you reach 25% of your battle group's break point, you've got to roll 2d6 on this table. No modifiers. Uh, so it's a straight-up roll, basically. And you want an 8 or greater, which means hold, no effect. A 7 is falter. All suppressed sections fall back 6 inches. Uh, 6 to 5 is retire. All suppressed sections fall back 12 inches. Uh, 4 or less, panic. All suppressed sections rout. So they'll be taken off the table. Double 1, disgrace. As 4 or less, above. And battle group headquarters routes as well. And it's got some fun little notes here about that. So let's do that roll and see what happens to the Americans. See if this battle is over. Well, it won't be over. Here we go, folks. Critical roll from the Americans. And they get a double six. Uh, I don't think that means anything special on this. I wouldn't think it would. I never actually got that result on this. So that is actually a good result. So they're all good. So they don't break. They're on, they would be considered hold, no effect. So there it is. All right, folks. So that's it so far. That is the situation. I can zoom out here. There you go. That's the battle so far. we got another turn coming up. Turn 7 is coming. I think the Germans are going to make that push. Uh, see if they can get their tanks up there moving. they still got a 75 on that flank of the village there to face with. Uh, yeah, that's the situation. See if the Germans could make a move on that bridge because you can't win the game outside of breaking the enemy unless you control both objectives in 15 turns. And this is only turn six. Okay, folks, we're going to go to turn seven.